from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. I'm Pat Harrison, President and CEO of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you all for joining us in this magnificent library. It truly is a testament to both preservation and access for every American. America's Library, the Library of Congress. And we are here tonight to celebrate the culmination of a vision which began over seven years ago. The idea was to create an American archive of public broadcasting, a digital repository for public media content that would include audio and video, local and national programs, recorded speeches, scripts, and photos, and the archive would preserve public broadcasting's unique content and contribution to our nation's history and really bring that history alive in a way that can connect America's great story with future generations. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting, with the leadership of a very committed CPB board, the dedicated archive team headed by Mark Ersling, hundreds of public media stations, our national public media organizations, PBS, APPS, NPR, and others, and CPB's American Archive National Advisory Panel all work together to turn this idea, this vision, into a reality, and that really is a cause for celebration. Tonight, we're also celebrating the new and prestigious permanent home for the American Archive here at the Library of Congress with WGBH working in tandem to preserve public broadcasting's unique content and contribution to our nation's history. The archive already includes 3.5 million hours of content 2.5, I just added an extra million, but we are on our way. <laughs> 2.5 million hours of content contributed by local stations from every corner of the country and digitized and cataloged through the expert guidance of WGBH. Under the stewardship of the library and the leadership of WGBH, the archive will indeed continue to grow. This evening, we are especially pleased to welcome leaders who have been steadfast supporters of public media, such as Chairman John Dingell, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, who with Congressman Don Young serves as the co-chairman of the Public Broadcasting Caucus, and Representatives Lance and Doris Matsui, Jim Cooper and Stephen Cohn. Later, you're going to hear from a great friend of public media, Senator Ed Markey. But now, I want you to meet one of our partners in the American Archive, Dr. Jim Billington, the Librarian of Congress. I am truly honored to know him and to have worked with him through public media and WETA, and we're very pleased that Sharon Rockefeller is with us tonight, and the Library of Congress Gershwin Prize for Popular Song. Dr. Billington was sworn in as the Librarian of Congress on September 4th, 1989. He is, only, he, is the, he is only the 13th person to hold this position since the library was established in 1800. His forward-leaning leadership was responsible for the library's National Digital Library Program, which makes available for free more than 31 million American historical and cultural documents online. He's also placed online a major bilingual website with Russian libraries, with the national libraries of Brazil and Spain, France, the Netherlands, and Egypt. He proposed the creation of a world digital library in 2005, 
which was endorsed by UNESCO in 2007 and launched online in 2009. Dr. Billington, a Princeton graduate, earned his doctorate from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He's received more than 40 honorary doctorates, and in 2008, he was presented with the Presidential Citizens Medal by President Bush. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Billington. Thank you very much, Pat, and uh, welcome to you all, particularly members of Congress, Senator Ed Markey and representatives uh, Earl Blumenauer, um, Leonard Lance, Jim Moran. Um, there may be others that I, but we thank them all, and I want to also um, say special thanks to you, uh, uh, Pat Harrison, as well as Patricia Cahill, Bruce Raymer, and John Abbott, all of whom are, are coming together for this wonderful evening here in the Great Hall of the Library. Now, the American people have made a huge investment um, over many decades in public radio and television. In 2007, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, with the support of Congress, created the American Archive Project to index all publicly funded radio and television um, broadcasts in the United States and to ensure their preservation and future public access. Now, last year, CPB selected from a wide range of applications, WGBH and the library here, to carry forward a joint project that will provide a central unified repository and management structure for this project so admirably launched by CPB, for which we all give special thanks tonight for their pioneering work in all this. Now, serving as the main audiovisual repository and preservation center is not a new experience for the Library of Congress, which began collecting the earliest American films ever made exactly 120 years ago in 1894, and has grown into the world's largest archival collection and preservation program for both the analog and the digital forms um, of movies, television, and recorded sound. Now, in 1995, Congress mandated that its library, the Library of Congress, survey and analyze the state of television preservation in the United States. We published our study, Television and video preservation in 1997 and stressed in that publication the extraordinary importance of public television for the national cultural patrimony of the United States, which is held here, uh, much of it in America's oldest federal cultural institution. So we said in that study that public television broadcasting, and I'm quoting now from that study, in the aggregate forms the richest audiovisual source of cultural history in the United States. We went on to say that uh, allowing it to be lost, eroded, and slowly eliminated would, and I'm now quoting again, symbolize one of the great conflagrations of our age tantamount to the burning of Alexandria's great library in the age of antiquity. Now, the American Archives Project will ensure that this creative history will be saved and made available to future generations. The library will house these treasures in our Packard campus for audiovisual conservation. The state-of-the-art preservation facility in Culpeper, Virginia, that was built for the library through the extraordinary private sector support and generosity of David Woodley Packard and the, his Packard Humanities Institute. And of course, with the full cooperation and support 
uh, of the Congress of the United States. Now, the Library of Congress um, holds the nation's largest archival collection of public broadcasting material, most of which was, uh, was produced for national audiences and distribution. The American Archive Project will s supplement and augment in important ways our holdings here, and we will add thereby tens of thousands of hours of material produced for and about local and regional audiences that have never been seen or heard elsewhere outside of those regions. So this extraordinary collection that we're celebrating tonight and thanking all those who made it possible includes local news and public uh, affairs programs, productions that document the heritage of local communities and programs dealing with religion, education, environmental issues, music, art, li um, literature, dance, poetry, and even filmmaking on the local level. The collection of public broadcasting materials will be preserved and made accessible to the school child as well as the scholar. Uh, and the extraordinary multimedia treasures from the Library of Congress collections will be significantly enhanced in this important way. Um, this has already been mentioned by Pat very generously. Um, uh, more than 30 million items uh, are already available online with expert curatorial explanations free of charge and widely used in K-12 education throughout the United States. The library is pleased and honored to co-celebrate with w WGBH, which has, of course, a acclaimed universally as a longtime leader in media production, media management, preservation, and rights management issues. Collaborative projects such as the American Archives are key to the library's larger role in collecting and managing America's cultural heritage, or at least a very significant and central part of it. The collaboration with WGBH will serve as an excellent model for the library's reaching out, as we'll be, have to continue to be doing, for new collaborator, collaborators who also work in knowledge space. In conclusion, uh, one more word of uh, personal praise for our partner in this project, John Abbott of WGBH, uh, and also uh, for WIDA, our local public broadcasting firm, and the marvelous Sharon Rockefeller, who is currently broadcasting the Library of Congress's current post laureate of the United States, Natasha Trethewey, um, as she takes poetry into surprising uh, places all over America and broadcast on public television. So we are very happy and we're very honored in this marvelous place, uh, which we owe to so many in the Congress and the American people over the years, to celebrate tonight the central role that the Corporation for Public Broadcasting has played in developing the American Archives Project and helping uh, to ensure that this material will survive and become accessible in its new home. So thanks to CPB from all of us here for supporting both public broadcasting and the preservation of America's extraordinary audiovisual creativity, a demonstration of all the varied richness that a free people have been able to produce in our marvelous country. Thank you all for being here and honoring us with your help, your cooperation, and your presence this evening. Thank you, Dr. Billington, and thank you for your leadership. President Obama appointed Patty Cahill to the CPB board in 2008, and last September she was unanimously elected 
by her fellow board members to serve a second term as chair of the CPB board. She is the first general manager of a radio station to serve as chair, but this is not surprising because Patty, Patty is a radio, public radio leader who served for 25 years as the general manager of KCUR FM, the public radio station at the University of Missouri, Kansas. The recipient of many awards and honors for her public media service, Patty is an assistant professor of communication studies at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and a past director of the NPR board and president of public radio in Mid-America. Please welcome Patty Cahill. I think this platform is taller than I am. Thank you for the kind introduction, Pat. Um, as general manager of the public radio station in Kansas City for most of my adult life, not all, I know firsthand about shelves full of tapes and back rooms with important moments of our community's history scattered all around the station. These tapes sit idle because stations must develop their limited resources to reporting on the present. I'm very pleased to say that the grants provided by the American Archive to date have given stations, like the station I managed, the resources they need to catalog what has been stored on these shelves. With the Library of Congress and WGBH working together, much of what we produce can now be preserved for the future. I want to thank the members of the American Archive National Advisory Panel, whose expertise and wisdom were very influential in determining where the American Archive should be housed. Henry Becton, Jr., Ken Burns, the Honorable John W. Carlin, Dr. Jeffrey Cole, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Deanna Markham, John Patek, Koki Roberts, Dr. Stephen D. Smith, the Honorable Margaret Spellings, Sir Howard Stringer, and Jesus Salvador Trevino. I think we need applause for them. Also on the panel was my fellow CPB board member and former board chair, Bruce Raymer. You can applaud now. <laughs> Bruce is a tireless advocate for the American Archive from its inception. He chaired the CPB's board task force on the American Archive and contributed greatly to making it a reality. Bruce has a long history of working with public television and was active for nearly 20 years on the board of public television station KCET in Los Angeles. He's a member of the Board of Counselors of the USC Edinburgh School for Communications and at Shoah Foundation Institute for Visual History and Education. An attorney and partner at Gang Tyre Raymer and Brown in Los Angeles, which represents some of the cutest men and women in Hollywood, Bruce has been described as a man it's hard to say no to, a quality that has served him well at least on the American Archive. Please join me in welcoming Bruce Raymer. Some of the cutest men and women? Uh, thank you, thank you, Patty. Um, I appreciate the kind words. I don't get them in private from you, so it's good to hear them in public. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight, and thank you for coming to this in this extraordinary hall. There's just no other way to describe it. And Jim, you have to be very proud of where you live, so to speak. Um, as someone who, um, who works in the entertainment industry, uh, I've learned through experience uh, the importance of preservation, particularly in film. In a comprehensive survey, the Library of Congress recently documented one of the great losses of, of the Hollywood movie industry. Almost 70% of the silent films are gone, largely due to neglect. Of the nearly 11,000 silent feature films made in America between 1912 and 1930, only 14 percent 
still exist in their original format, and about 11% only survive as foreign versions or as low quality formats. Think of the incredible loss to the culture of this country and I would, I would say of the world. Public broadcasting has been serving our nation for over 40 years. Hundreds of stations all around the country have been producing content that spans a, a wide variety of genre, arts, entertainment, news, public affairs, history, social issues, and so on. This content has captured the changing nature of American life and culture, and the American Archive of Public Broadcasting will ensure that much of it will be preserved for future generations. As Patty noted in 2009, uh, I was granted the honor of, uh, by my colleagues on the CPB board of chairing the American Archive Task Force. The task force itself brought together archivists, station managers, media and technology experts, and yes, even attorneys, who helped us identify the challenges we needed to address. We provided grants to stations to comb through the stacks of tape and reels of film scattered around station closets, under desks, and on backroom shelves. Patty mentioned in her KCUR that kind of um, oversight, really, for a treasure trove of, of materials. We identified the content most worth saving and with the help of WGBH, cataloged and digitized much of it. This work is difficult and it will continue to be challenging, but the benefits to future generations is clear. To quote Winston Churchill, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. And we like to think we're optimists at CPB. In fact, we have to be optimists at CPB, not that I think of it. The work is far from finished, and we're pleased that the Library of Congress and WGBH have agreed to carry it on. This material will allow historians, writers, reporters, and just simply interested individuals to experience a community's history. Uh, national events, social issues, as it was chronicled by the people of the community. Now, it'll provide an authentic and, and unique window into the past for citizens of the future. I'm honored to be part of this gathering to celebrate this achievement. And it's my pleasure now to share with you a sample of the invaluable historic content that's being preserved through the American Archive. 20 public broadcasting stations helped WGBH make the selections you're about to see from thousands of hours of programming. <clears throat> Without the archive, this, much of this material would have been lost. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at just how much of our history it is possible to share in just a few minutes, and I'm delighted that all of us are part of this preservation. Thank you. Exactly what is videotape? Well, now, videotape is, it's brown like this. It looks like chocolate, and it's awfully slippery. It is. Yeah. She was a natural, as passionate and funny in this spoof as she was in her TV kitchen. Well, oh, no, I'm editing the tapes for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. That is slippery tape can be found in the archives and closets of public broadcasting stations across the country. It holds decades of treasures, but it's highly perishable. Images disintegrate, disappear. It can happen in less than 10 years. At Risk is a part of our collective memory. It's rare, often unique, because public media's mission from the first was ambitious, unprecedented. Good evening, I'm Ed Merle, and this is Channel 13, WNDT, something rather different. The real function of this station will be to cover the province of all mankind. The goals were lofty, but the adventure began with small local steps. Hello, boys and girls. Écoutez. Je vois un homme. I would like to talk to you about opera. Guiding the little figures into posture. Oh, now look at what's happened. But soon came a glimpse inside a master class. Why you do that? Tough love. For Pablo Casals' young cellist. First finger. 
for second field. And theater. Buenos dias, senor. Hablo inglés, yeah? Martin Sheen. What is it you want? And where's the punctuation? Dustin Hoffman. You see the punctuation? What has he done with that? <laughs> Extraordinary moments in the struggle for civil rights. When Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, violence erupted in cities across the country. James Brown was scheduled to perform at the Boston Garden the next night. The mayor of Boston asked WGBH to broadcast the concert in the hope that citizens would stay home and watch and keep the peace. Mayor Kevin, give him a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. He's a swing again. So all I ask you tonight is this, honor Dr. King in peace. It worked. The streets of Boston stayed quiet. Later, Eyes on the Prize reached back to tell the story of the battle for civil rights through the experience of ordinary citizens. It was a sense of community moving there. And as you walk, you saw the power of the most powerful country on the face of the earth. Rich history, deeply researched, unforgettable stories, our stories, preserved for future audiences at the Library of Congress and shared online when possible in the American Archive. Our stories, our struggles, sometimes recorded by anguished accident, as in a radio broadcast of an afternoon concert in November 1963. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a press report over the wires. We hope that it is unconfirmed that the President of the United States has been the victim of an assassination. What does assassination mean? As the turmoil increased through the 60s, Mr. Rogers spoke out for children. I plead for your protection and support of your young children. You're a puppet. I, I can prove it to you, Ralph. Just, just look down. At WITF in Hershey, Pennsylvania, Jim Henson experimented with characters he called Muppets. There's a man down there. Sesame Street created a safe place for kids and parents. Zoom became the first interactive program for children. Generations of Americans have grown up with these programs. They shaped how we learned and how we saw ourselves and our future. We're creating a chronicle of our life and time with adventures we share from Nova, Carl Sagan's Cosmos, Nature. Voices from all over. Six decades of creative energy connecting us to our past, guiding us toward the future. The best our civilization has to offer in the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Good evening, I'm John Abbott, president of WGBH, and thank you. <clears throat> and thank you, Dr. Billington, for having us and for being such a wonderful partner at the commencement of this extraordinary endeavor for the American people. As Rod Stewart reminds us, every picture tells a story, and the extraordinary collection in the American Archive of Public Broadcasting truly tells our nation's collective story. I'd like to thank my colleagues at WGBH for giving us that glimpse of our collective story through the video reel, and in particular, our executive producer, Elizabeth Dean, who I believe is here. Elizabeth, thank you. We are extraordinarily proud to be working in partnership with the Library of Congress to preserve these historic treasures. Being chosen for this project is a tribute to the 25 years of dedicated work by the WGBH archive team under the leadership of Sue Kantrowitz and Karen Cariani, who are both here as well. Somewhere, there we are. Thank you to Sue and Karen. But it's the vision of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, its president, Pat Harrison, and its board members that have made the dream of the American archive a reality. 
We are so grateful for CPB's leadership and, in, and support in recognizing the value, as Bruce said, of preserving these public media assets for time. Of course, there have been occasions when the preservation of CPB itself was in question, and we were fortunate that certain members of Congress recognized its value. None more than the next speaker, who I have the great privilege to introduce. Before he became Senator Edward Markey last year, Congressman Ed Markey of Massachusetts was a tireless advocate for the work of public broadcasting during his 37 years in the House of Representatives. He advanced the cause of quality children's programs with the Children's Television Act of 1990, increasing the quantity of educational programs for every American family. He transformed media into a tool for access for deaf and blind audiences, first in 1990 through the TV Decoder Act, then again in 1996 with powerful provisions in the Telecommunications Act, and in 2010, his 21st Century Communications and Visibility Act extended access to the internet, ensuring that information is available to all. But it was when federal funding for public broadcasting was threatened for elimination in 1995 and in 1997 and in 2005 and in 2011 that he stepped forward as the true champion of our cause, believing in the power, reach, impact, and value of community-based public media serving every community in our nation. Again and again, he not only spoke out in defense of public television and radio, but he organized community efforts. He enlisted the support of other legislators, and he publicly stood shoulder to ear with our famed aardvark, Arthur, and declared that CPB really stands for children and parents' benefit. We can only imagine what's in store for us now from Senator Markey. And WGBH and public media have no greater ally, and we're enormously grateful for his vision, commitment, and leadership and on this important night in the life of public media and the life of our nation, we're grateful to have him here. He's an unwavering advocate for our mission of education and public service and a true champion of public broadcasting and the work of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and of our stations in communities across the country. It's my very great honor to introduce our friend, Senator Edward Markey. Thank you. Thank you, John, so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, you are a one-man powerhouse when it comes to bringing the best in public broadcasting to viewers in Massachusetts and across America. And you're sitting next to your great predecessor, Henry Becton. Uh, I'm from Malden, Massachusetts, and Henry Becton's great-grandfather was the mayor of Malden, just so you know uh, where, from whence we both come. And uh, John, you and your team at WGBH epitomize excellence in every single way. And I need Sharon Rockefeller to put her hands over her ears as I say that WGBH truly stands for world's greatest broadcasting house. And, uh, and we thank you for everything that you do uh, for our region and for our country. And thank you to Patricia Harrison, Patty Cahill, Bruce Raymer, uh, and everyone else with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, um, to uh, the great Sharon Rockefeller for everything that you do uh, from the beginning of public broadcasting time uh, to make this the great network which it is. Uh, thank you. I see uh, Congressman Lance out there, Jim Moran uh, from Virginia, Earl Blumenauer from the state of uh, Oregon, uh, and to uh, my old pal, uh, Senator David Pryor from Arkansas, a, a great servant of our country. It is so great to have you here uh, as well on this fantastic night. And thank you to Jim Billington. Huh? and his wife Marjorie, who is here tonight. Does he have the best job in America? Huh? What, what he gets to do is absolutely fantastic. And it is great that you open your doors to this magnificent building to us this evening. And it is also fitting that 
here in the Library of Congress this shining pantheon of knowledge and American culture and arts and entertainment that we celebrate such an exciting new chapter in public broadcasting. There is no better place for public broadcasting's archive than this library. And it will be preserved here for all of eternity, for all Americans and all citizens of the world forever, as it should be. Uh, I have a I have to say I feel up here, I feel a little bit lonely up here on the stage when I talk about public television. I usually have an odd uh, and a big yellow bird standing next to me as we're defending your budget. So uh, they say in Washington that if you want a friend, get a dog. Uh, if you have friends in public TV, it means you have Clifford the Big Red Dog because it has, it has been protecting your budget uh, because people know that your shows are the shows that they grew up watching and loving and learning from and now will all be preserved here in the Library of Congress forever. And their quality is eternal. Uh, children 100 years from now will be laughing and learning in the same way that children of this era learn from those very same programs. You are all such phenomenal stewards of the crown jewel of the American media mix, our public broadcasting system. And it is great to be here with you tonight to celebrate your archiving effort so that your decades of historical programming will live on forever and it will have this truly incomparable content that will be as val valuable as all of the books that have been stored here that, have, that keep the history of literature, of history of our planet stored in this building, so too now will this new means by which we communicate also be stored forever. And Julia Child, I grew up just lying on the rug in, in, uh, uh, in Malden, Massachusetts, uh, as my mother would be paying attention very closely to Julia Child as she brought French cooking to Malden, Massachusetts, as my father, the milkman, was about to become a beneficiary of her, my mother learning from Julia Child and telling my brothers and I how fortunate we were that there was a Julia Child uh, equally as important in uh, in his mind as my mother, an Irish woman, was in, in helping to train her to cook as a French uh, chef would cook, and so we were the beneficiaries of that show, uh, of that show. And her joy of cooking was communicated to my mother, and through that to us. In a world of fast and furious television with ratings-driven content, public television represents the last stronghold of quality, education-oriented programming. In fact. If public broadcasting did not exist, we right now would be trying to invent it. That is how good it is from 6 o'clock every morning right through to midnight and beyond every day in every city and every town in the United States of America. So this tonight is a tremendous uh, evening. Uh, it is a parent's best friend, this program, a teacher's best friend, and an adult's best friend. Uh, as they uh, turn on that channel every single evening in our, uh, in our country. It reaches to the very soul of who we are, to the very core of who we are as a people. So that scene that you just saw of Kevin White and James Brown on the stage at Boston Garden would be hard to fully appreciate if you didn't know that in every other major city in America, a conflagration broke out that night. But WGBH decided, in cooperation with the mayor and James Brown, that they would broadcast the entire show live from Boston Garden with 13,000 people there so that every person in Boston could see it. And then James Brown urged everyone to stay home and watch the show in Roxbury, in Dorchester, and they did. And when 13,000 people left Boston Garden that night, they went home peacefully. That was public television at its best, the only city that did not have a conflagration that night. I remember just a year later, they had a program where 
Professor Jerome Letvin of MIT debated Dr. Timothy Leary, who was the proponent of LSD, and they broadcast it live for two hours and it promoted it for days, this showdown, as Timothy Leary sat on the stage at MIT in front of the student body and Jerome Letvin circled him and destroyed him and his argument in two hours in this riveting, riveting television that will be there forever if anyone ever wants to see the defining debate about the role that drugs can play in altering the lives of young people. And so for me, and I think for everyone in this room, we know that is why we're celebrating this evening. That is why this archive is so important because all of these memorable and historic moments and programs are now going to be preserved. And they won't be in some dark basement as dusty tape eroding, being destroyed. The enemy of this inexorable march of time that just destroys those things that have not been preserved. But now they will be saved. And that enemy will be defeated. And it will be defeated because of this incredible effort that has been put together in order to begin this pathway. So public television doesn't belong to any one party. It belongs to the people of the United States of America who consistently find it to be one of the most valuable institutions in the United States of America. And John, you talked about the role of closed captioning, the role of all these other innovative technologies. Well, at the front of the line in every one of the breakthroughs was the public broadcasting system, was WGBH, in fact, WETA. Those were the actual specific stations that were the leaders in innovation that the rest of the commercial broadcast industry uh, followed. So for me, uh, tonight is just a great honor to be here with you. Uh, because as we look to the future, we know that you are putting your treasure trove of content at the fingertips of parents and teachers and children around the world. The federal funding that supported the creation of these iconic programs is now being leveraged in our interconnected online environment. And that is fantastic. And it is only the beginning. Because from here, we are going to archive more and more of this uh, information, and it will be there again, as I said, for all of eternity. I thank all of you for everything that you do in the public broadcasting community every single day of your lives. You have no idea the impact that it has uh, in making sure that there is a democratization of access to information, to educational materials, to that uplifting message of what our country can be that occurs on a daily basis. And I know as the son of a milkman that uh, the Channel 2 in Boston played an invaluable role in my life in lifting my gaze to the constellation of possibilities for myself, for my country, and for my world. And for that, I am eternally grateful. And I think I speak for tens of millions of Americans who say thank you. And thank you to Jim Billington. Thank you for PBS for now preserving it for all of eternity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Markey, for being such a champion. And we need champions. And now we have one in the Senate. So that's even nicer. It means a great deal for you to be here with us this evening. And I uh, want to also thank you for your service to our country. And thank you as well, Dr. Billington and Patty Cahill and Bruce Raymer, my very good friend, John Abbott. This is going to be a wonderful, wonderful collaboration. And to each of you, everyone here is connected in some way to the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. We're preserving America's stories as we continue to tell those stories. Enjoy your evening. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.